Today on Know the Truth from Philip DeCourcy. I don't believe that my life is just part of some big machine and I'm caught in the cogs of this kind of cold universe. But I do believe there's a sovereign God who orders the events of mankind and he decides what happens. And I can live with that because he'll make everything beautiful in his time. I've got to give him time. According to Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. But what does this mean for you? Today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy explores how this ancient wisdom applies to our modern day lives. We're learning to recognize God's hand in both joyful and difficult times and find peace in His perfect timing. It's a message titled, It's About Time, from our series of the same title. You can access the full message online at ktt.org. Here's Pastor Philip. God has a plan that embraces every man, every woman, every child, and all their actions. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. And the great thing about this plan is that it's fitting, it's good, and according to verse 11, it's beautiful. Look at what we read in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11. God has made everything beautiful in its time. Time is a divine tapestry that God is weaving together intricately and exquisitely. And that means, this is good, the future is not to be feared and the present is not to be fought. Because where you are and what you're going through has been appointed and ordered. That's what we're going to be taught here. So let's look at this passage. There's three perspectives. The blending of time, verses 1 through 8. The sending of time, verses 9 through 15. And the ending of time, verses 16 through 22. Let's begin to look at verses 1 through 8. What I call the blending of time. This section begins with a bold declaration that whatever comes in life, God has purposed and planned it. And Solomon wants us to see that the genesis of life is in the divine will that which God has appointed. Life may be a series of contradictions to us, a series of contrasts to us. It may be on a given day, a jumbled mess to us, but from where God sits, there is a time and a season to it all and a purpose behind it and beneath it. So let's look at verse one quickly and then begin to look at the succeeding verses. Note that every activity Everything, every willful action of man has its proper time and its proper duration. There's a time and there's a season mentioned in this passage. I think the word time means point in time. There's a point at which something begins, maybe birth, it may be death, maybe loss, it may be gain, but there'll there'll come a point in time where something will happen and then there'll be a season to that and there'll be a duration to that. And we're to be reminded of the fact that there's purpose behind it. There's a sovereign hand superintending it all. The mundane, momentary, multitudinous details of our lives is part of a bigger scheme. And you got to bear that in mind. That's the umbrella under which the rest of these verses find themselves. What follows is a beautiful poetic description of life in all its variableness. And it's important that you and I see that what we have here in verses 2 through 8 is a blending of what God sends our way. Grammatically, what we have here is a merismus in the Hebrew grammar. Because you'll see this is a poem. There's design to the structure of this. And that's important. This is a linguistic device that's used to set opposites in opposition to each other. It's a way of expressing something and everything that happens beyond it and between it. That's why we talk about north and south and we talk about heaven and hell and everything in between. And that's what you have here. Kind of summarizing life by using a marismus. These statements take us on a tour de force of life's topography. 
We've got an observation of life's routine and rhythm. We will be shuttled between all these events. It's a summary. It's a sampling. It's not a statement about everything that possibly can happen, but a summary of it. And it's important because sometimes this passage is presented by preachers and writers as kind of, look, there's a time for everything and a purpose to that time. Therefore, you need discernment. You need to work out when that time is and and you need to be ready for it. You don't want to miss the boat being ready for that pregnant moment. I think that's the turn of passage on its head. The emphasis in this passage is not on what man does, but what God does. He'll make everything beautiful in its time. It's not so much that these are things that you and I will do. These are things that you and I will find ourselves in. Situations that we will land in at a time not of our choosing. That's the whole point. Did you choose the day you were born? Will you choose the day you die? No, that's the whole point here. God appoints the time. Then we read here, not only there's a time to be born and a time to die, but we read here there's a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. If you look at Isaiah 5, verses 1 and 5, God says to Israel, I planted you and I can pluck you, depending on your obedience. Paul doesn't even speak of the work of evangelism in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 5 through 9, reminds us somebody sows, somebody waters, but it's God that gives the increase. There's a time to plant. There's a time to pluck. And we need to be part of that process. There's a time to kill and a time to heal. This most likely doesn't refer to war because that's picked up in verse 8, a time of war and a time of peace. A number of commentators suggest this, and I tend to have a sympathy with what they're talking about. We may be talking here about sickness and plagues. Remember we read in Hannah's song, 1 Samuel 2, verse 6, that the Lord kills and the Lord makes alive. Sometimes in life, sickness takes one, doesn't take the other. Plagues come, one family dies and another family survives. Others would suggest it may be speaking about the legitimate ending of life in terms of self-defense or capital punishment. There is a time to kill, either in self-defense or to take the life of someone that's taken life for the preservation of society and the respect for the image of God and man. There's a time to break down and a time to build up. There's a time for construction and there's a time for demolition. In the wider sense, I think it might speak of advancing and retreating or reversal. Sometimes a lick of paint will do the job. At other times, you need the sledgehammer. Sometimes you have to start afresh and go back to the drawing board. Sometimes the old must be replaced by the new. But then at other times, that which is can be fixed. That which remains can be strengthened. Revelation 3 verse 2 tells us that, doesn't it? When Jesus is speaking to the church at Sardis, you have a reputation that you're alive, but you're dead. But strengthen those things that remain and are ready to die. Okay? So you and I in life will be faced with situations. Do we build this thing up? Do we breathe some new life into it? Or do we knock it down, set it aside? Just because something's old, by the way, doesn't mean it ought to be discarded. Traditions ought not to be summarily trashed. Maybe they need a new coat of paint. Maybe they need some life breathed back into them because they're still good, still have their purpose. Those are the things you got to work up on life. When I was a young pastor, Warren Wearsby really helped me think through about how you deal with a church's traditions and its habits. He calls it the church furniture. And he warns the young pastor about getting into a new ministry and playing with the furniture. And he says this like, realize why the furniture's there. And before you move it, understand why it's there. You better have a good reason for moving it. And if you're going to move it, you need to stay there because life has taught him that when you move the furniture and leave, the people move the furniture back. It's the way life works. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh, verse 4, and a time to mourn and a time to dance. We'll take these two thoughts together. This speaks of the wide range of emotions that are part of life. Which one of us hasn't had a belly laugh? And we love that, it's good for us. Then which one of us hasn't dried away a tear or wept profusely after some heartache 
some difficult time in life. Solomon's got it, hasn't he? He knows what life is like. And I put these two things together because they intensify. I think the first line is built on and is intensified in the second line. And so you go from crying to mourning and you go from laughing to dancing. Some commentators argue that you've gone from the private arena to the public arena. And you and I need to be wise. There's a time to laugh and there's a time to cry. James 4 verse 9 says what? Turn your laughter in the morning. Sometimes we laugh at the most inappropriate time. I think our culture is losing a sense of dignity and decorum. We don't know how to behave at a funeral. We don't know how to behave at a ceremony. We're all so casual. We forgot there's times and seasons and appropriate behavior for those times and seasons. And you and I need to learn that. We're not to be a sarpus all the time, and we're not to be a circus clown all the time. I just finished a book called Trace Said to Troy. It's a book on Ohio State, and that shouldn't surprise anybody. And I was excited to read about that before any big college game, there was a tradition at Ohio State that the team would watch a movie the night before. Now, Woody Hayes was pretty strict. He didn't like movies that weren't clean and wholesome, pro-American. And nine times out of ten, he encouraged the guys to watch a John Wayne flick. Some years later, Bruce Earl takes the team. He pretty much keeps Woody Hayes' standards going, except he bans comedies. No comedies were allowed to be watched the night before the game. Why? Quote, this is his reasoning, you cannot make a tackle with a smile on your face. It's a good quote. There's a time to laugh, but not before a big game. Get the game face on. You got to go and tear the throat out of this team and win the game. There's a time and a season to everything. Now, we'll pick the rest of that up. A couple of applications. Number one, come to terms with the sovereignty of God. Because this passage is all about the fact that our times are in His hands. Now, we don't like that. Oh, we're a nation of self-determination. Baloney. We're a nation that will rise and fall under the sovereign hand of God. And the less we acknowledge him, the quicker that demise will come. Self-determination. What arrogance. There's a time and a season to everything under the sun. But I don't set those times and I don't manage those seasons in the large scheme of things. Therefore, I need to embrace the sovereignty of God. Birth, death, sorrow, joy, loss, gain, war, peace. Walter Kaiser says something, everything has its time from God. All the labor of a man by itself cannot change the time, circumstances, or control the events. That's the meaning of verse 9. What profit has the worker for that which he labors? What's the point there? The labor of man, although significant in the ultimate sense, doesn't alter the plan of God. We can never ensure by our labor, by our efforts, that it's only going to be times of birth, times of harvesting, times of laughing, times of love. No, it won't always stay that way. There'll be a time to love and a time to hate. There'll be a time to gain. There'll be a time to lose. There'll be a time to be born and a time to die. That's the way it is. And you know what? That's scary. It is scary to realize that, you know what? Much of life is out of our control. But I would say this in parentheses. Here's, here's the encouraging thing. We're not left to the mercy of cold and blind fate. That's our worldview I don't believe I'm part of a closed system. I don't believe that I'm the product of some evolutionary process. I don't believe that my life is just part of some big machine and I'm caught in the cogs of this kind of cold universe. I don't believe that. But I do believe there's a sovereign God who orders the events of mankind and he takes the initiative and he decides what happens. And I can live with that because he'll make everything beautiful in his time. I've got to give him time. And I've got to leave my times in his hands. He's doing something I don't like, don't see, don't want. But eventually I'll want and thank him for. And you know what? 
If we move on to the New Testament, you see those hands? Our times are in his hands, Psalm 31, verse 15. Just look at those hands. There's holes in them. They're scarred. Because God came in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus, and showed his love toward us. So he is sovereign, but he's loving. And if I'm at his mercy, I'll take his mercy any day of the week. That's why I need to remind you of that fact. John Chancellor, at age 67, was just settling into retirement at 43. He was a broadcaster, a journalist. He had been with NBC Nightly News for many years. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. He had a nice nest egg. He was looking forward to life until he discovered he had cancer of the stomach. And his world crashed, and he became angry and bitter with life and with God. Why me? Why now? Why this? But God worked in his life, made peace with both life and God. And just before his death, he said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. It's Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 11. There's a time and a season to everything under the sun. But we're not speaking about your day planner, iPad or whatever. We're talking about God's plan and his scheme. And I got to make peace with that and come to terms with that. Life always won't work out the way I want. I won't like the hand I'm dealt, but when I understand from whose hand it comes, I'll embrace it. And I'll say with Job, though he slays me, yet will I trust him. One last thought. Number two, prepare for change and drop the happy ever after nonsense. Okay? Grow out of your love of Disney at some point. Because this passage reminds us that life will be made up of birth and death, loss and gain, crying and laughing, war and peace. And we need to prepare ourselves for those different seasons and embrace them. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job 1.21, Paul says, I have learned to be full and I have learned to be empty. Philippians 4 verses 11 through 12. Wouldn't you agree that life is a roller coaster? One day you'll laugh with your children. The next day they'll make you cry. One day you'd die for them. The next day you'd kill them, given the chance. That's the way life is. It's a firestorm one day and it's sunshine the next. And that's because we're not in Kansas anymore. To borrow a word from Dorothy in Wizard of Oz, this world isn't what it once was. It isn't what it will yet become. It's a cursed place. There's good to be had. There's love to be enjoyed, but there's sin to be faced. And that's the reality. And you and I need to adjust to the sovereignty of God. And we need to adjust to the fact that life will change. And we've got to get rid of this happy ever after myth. We won't always be healthy. We won't always have lots of friends. We won't always have plenty of money. We won't always balance the books at the end of the month. We won't always score a birdie on the 18th green. We won't always tidy our desk at the end of the day. Because life is going to shuttle us between these places and all these experiences. So there is no plateau. There is no station to arrive at. Don't expect something more. We're setting our young people up for failure. We're setting our country up for failure. Life changes. Nations rise and fall. Economies boom and economies burst. There's births, there's deaths. Listen to these words from Kurt Bruner in a very good little book I got years ago. I don't know if it's still in print, Traveling Light. Most of us look forward to some event, status, person, or experience to move our lives beyond the once upon a time, happy ever after, Dale. Perhaps we expect to ride off into the sunset with our handsome prince or beautiful princess to live in an eternal bliss. For some, it may be the desire for a certain status, a certain salary. Others may want a wicked stepmother or some undesirable person to be permanently uh, exit life. Regardless of the specific longings, the impact is the same. You cannot find contentment with life because we're eagerly waiting for a happy ending that will not come. 
Sooner or later, however, we must all accept the reality. Happy ever after will never arrive. Even if the promotion comes, there'll be new sources of frustration. Even if you get the raise, you won't have enough money. Even if the wedding day arrives, this person won't meet every need. If you get rid of the problem person, another one will poke up behind them. No matter what the dream, it cannot bring you into a state of permanent tranquility. That's a fact. That's why I like the story of the man dealing with dandelions in his garden. Tried everything he could buy at Home Depot. So out of desperation, he writes a letter to the Department of Agriculture. Says, hey, what do you suggest? Gets a letter back. Here's what they suggest. Learn to live with them. Dandelions are part of lawns. They'll come up every season and every summer, as with other things in life. That's why you've got to come to terms with the sovereignty of God, the fallenness of this world. The happy ever after comes after this life. And that's why you need to change your attitude and get rid of the happy ever after myth. There's nothing better than to get up each day and say, this is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice in it and everything he has in it. And there's nothing better for me than to eat and drink, do what God has called me to do, love those whom God has called me to love. Everything else is outside of my control. I will eat and I will drink and I will receive life as from the hand of God, as a gift from God. Let's pray. Father, what a marvelous passage of Scripture. We need to tuck it away. Lord, we recognize your sovereignty. Humble us, make us feel small again. Help us to tremble at your throne. We're not the masters of our own fate. Help us never to pray the arrogance of Invictus. As a nation, give us humility. Responsibility is one thing. Self-determination, it's an arrogant thing. Lord, help us to realize you determine. Help us, therefore, to fear you, seek you, honor you in all that we do as a people, as a church, and as a nation. For we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A powerful prayer following a powerful message from Pastor Philip DeCourcy here on Know the Truth. Philip will be back in just a moment. Today's message was titled, It's About Time, and you can hear it again by visiting ktt.org. At Know the Truth, it's our mission to proclaim God's truth so that men and women can live in the freedom and fullness Christ provides. Whether the topic is time, purpose, or spiritual investment, Philip shares biblical truth that builds you up and equips you to live a life that honors God. And one of the ways he does so is by choosing practical, powerful resources. This month's featured resource is a book that offers heartfelt encouragement and support for anyone feeling overwhelmed by life's trials. It's called Invest Your Disappointments, Going for Growth. In this book, author Paul Mollard takes a compassionate approach that assures readers they are not alone and that their disappointments can lead to a more fulfilling, God-centered life. You can request a copy of Investor Disappointments by giving a gift of any amount to know the truth. Call us at 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. Philip? Hey, Pastor Philip again, inviting you to join me October the 7th for the first annual Know the Truth Golf Tournament and Dinner. We are excited. Enjoy a great day of golf win prizes, and share a time of fellowship on the links and during dinner later in the day. You'll hear from me as I share stories and exciting updates about the Know the Truth ministry. You need to know this. All funds raised from the tournament will support Know the Truth and its work of sharing the gospel with a world in need of truth through their preaching and teaching of God's Word unashamed. I hope to see you and your friends there. You can learn more and register online at ktt.org. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Pastor Philip. Well, I'm Wayne Shepherd. Join us next time for more Bible teaching from Philip DeCourcy here on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Mm-hmm.